Hi, I'm Kristen Hislop. I'm the Marine Conservation Program Director at the Environmental Defense Center. Thank you all so much for coming and for your interest in this very important issue uh, of offshore oil potentially coming back to the Santa Barbara Channel. Um, we are partnering with Sierra Club and Get Oil Out tonight to give you all the information hopefully you need to be informed on what's happening right now and be able to provide some of your own input and energy behind trying to keep new oil development away from our region. So I would like to first thank our electeds and their staffers for being here today. From Senator Dianne Feinstein's office, we have Jeanette Chang. From Congressman Salude Carbajal's office, we have Wendy Moda. <laughs> Senator Hannah Beth Jackson's office, Brad Hudson. <laughs> Assemblymember Monique Limon, we have Samantha Omana. <laughs> Supervisor Doss Williams should be here at some point today. Um, we also have Gina Fisher from Joan Hartman's office, Santa Barbara County Supervisor. <laughs> And from the Goleta City Council, we have Kyle Richards. And from the Goleta School Board, we have Susan Epstein. And if I missed anyone, please let us know and we will announce you. Um, so I'm going to give you a quick overview of, of how tonight's going to go and, uh, and then we'll get started. So first we're going to have some panelists to give you an overview of some of the history of oil in the Santa Barbara Channel and uh, the importance of moving away from that and then the current process, what's happening with the federal government and the potential to create new leases in the Santa Barbara Channel and California and the West Coast and 90% of America's waters right now. Um, quickly, I won't go into too much detail because our panelists will be doing that, but if you hear the word BOEM by accident, because I think everyone will try to uh, not use acronyms, but if they do, they're referring to the federal agency that is responsible for the leasing we're going to be talking about, which is the Bureau of Ocean and Energy Management. So if you hear BOEM, that's what they're talking about. Um, and then after that, we're going to have our electeds or their representatives uh, give a quick uh, overview of what they're doing to combat this, this issue. And then we're going to have a question and answer. So if you all have questions that you would like addressed by our panelists or by our electeds, we have note cards at all the tables in the back, and you can write down those questions and hand them to uh, Environmental Defense Center staff. Betsy is in the back waving her hand, um, Owen here, and then we will read those questions and consolidate and do a Q&A. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Mike Lyons from Get Oil Out, who will be giving us our first presentation. Thank you. Good evening. It's good to see you all. My name is Michael Lyons, and I'm the current board president of Get Oil Out. Um, recently, we've all been significantly impacted after the recent fires and mudslides. These natural disasters have periodically been occurring throughout history of our region and will occur and will continue to occur, hopefully to a lesser extent. Similarly, what brings us here tonight is not the potential of naturally occurring disasters, but the potential for human-induced disasters resulting from newly proposed federal oil development off our coastline. Since oil production off our coastline came about, oil spills similarly to natural disasters have been repeatedly occurring. Some of the earliest known oil drilling in Santa Barbara County occurred off the beaches and piers of Summerland in the late 1800s. Little did those drillers know at that time that their endeavors would spawn an entire history and legacy of oil drilling, which continues in our community today. This long ongoing history of oil development in Santa Barbara County not only includes catastrophic oil spill disasters such as the 1969 Santa Barbara Channel spill and the most recent 2015 Refugio oil spill, but also many would say was the birth of the modern day environmental movement. In the mid 1900s, the state of California began leasing numerous offshore oil parcels to oil developers. From the mid 1900s to the late 1960s, a significant amount of oil was continually produced from these state leases off our coastline. Between 1968 and 1984, 
the federal government leased numerous parcels to oil developers in the Santa Barbara Channel. One of these federally owned lease parcels was the Union Oil Company, which constructed Platform A, 5.8 miles off the coast of Summerland. On January 28, 1969, Union Oil's Platform A had an accidental high-pressure blowout of oil. Approximately 3.258 million gallons of oil gushed to the ocean surface and spread with wind and ocean currents. Wildlife, beaches, and local economies all suffered immensely. Oil from the spill could be found from as far north as Pismo Beach and as far south as the Mexican border. Those who witnessed the spill's devastation became alert to the threat which our modern lifestyle posed on the environment, that there was a far heavier price to pay besides the cost of found on our utility bills and gas pumps. In fact, the 69 spill is the third largest oil spill in America's history, only behind the Valdez spill in Alaska and the Deepwater Horizon spill in the Gulf of Mexico. Currently, there are 19 federally leased offshore platforms off our coast. Ever since the 69 oil spill, Goo, Get Oil Out, has been diligently working to monitor and prevent oil spills from occurring on both federal and state leased parcels with a David and Goliath spirited success. Just this last year, oil producer Venico quit claimed three Elwood leases back to the state. Thank you. Thus greatly reducing the threat of future oil spills along this section of our coastline. Today, five state leases still exist in Santa Barbara County, and none of them are producing oil. Prior to Venico's quit claim of their Elwood leases, Get Oil Out was extremely involved in fighting proposed oil production on these leases and also worked against the, recom the recommissioning of the associated lease 421. Goo continually fights the oil companies in order to prevent oil spills. Some of our recent and continual battles include one, the removal of debris piles left behind when the 4-H platforms, Hope, Heidi, Hilda, and Hazel were abandoned in state waters in 1996. Two, the prevention of trucking of oil on highways along our coast as a result of the 2015 refugio spill. Three, working with the Environmental Defense Center to review the proposed proposal by ExxonMobil to restart oil production on two of their platforms and transport up to 70 trucks of oil per day from Las Flores Canyon to Santa Maria for up to seven years or until a new re repaired pipeline is available. And four, working with the EDC, the Environmental Defense Center, to review the proposal by Plains All America Pipeline to construct a new 125 mile long pipeline to replace the existing corroded and unusable pipeline, which caused the refugio oil spill. And finally, the GU board has voted to oppose the administration's proposed five year plan to lease federal offshore parcels for oil production. The current administration's proposal is an embarrassment to those Californians who treasure our ocean and coastline. California and organizations such as Get Oil Out have worked tirelessly to protect our priceless ocean environment from new and existing development and its threat for nearly half a century. The proposal for oil development serves to set America back during a time when alternative energy technologies are not just on the forefront, but are proving to be far superior in every way to the old fashioned fossil fuel program this current administration is proposing. Thank you. Okay, next we have Katie Davis from the Sierra Club.
So the first point I want to make is we don't need more oil. The, un <laughs> the United States is already the number one producer of oil in the world. We now produce more oil than Saudi Arabia. I have the list here. And we're exporting an increasing amount, too. Even here on the West Coast, we um, oil exports and oil products, refined products, the exports from the West Coast have almost doubled in the last 10 years. So we're not holding on to every last precious drop. And we're at a point now, right now, where we can't, we can't afford to increase unconventional oil production on a worldwide basis. We can't do that and still meet the internationally agreed upon limits on global warming. Those two things are incompatible. You can't do both. And we have to meet those international commitments on, on global warming. Whatever Trump may say or do, we have to figure out a way to meet them. Because climate change is not some future theoretical problem now. It's something that's happening here and now. The climate is changing faster than species can evolve and adapt. We're breaking heat and weather disaster records almost every year. No one is safe and nowhere is safe from a rapidly changing climate. Right now, we are all Montecito, vulnerable in ways we can hardly even imagine. And, and so we have to figure out a way to do that. Um, so if we can't increase unconventional oil production, we need to start scaling back some of the worst kinds of production, or at least not expanding them, right? And those include fracking offshore along m the most populated coastline, the most economically and environmentally important areas like the entire California coast, which has been off limits to new leases for decades under both Democratic and Republican administrations. There was a moratorium on Pacific, new Pacific oil leases under George H. H. Bush, the senior. That's how long we've had this consensus about how, what a bad and dumb idea it is to, to, to drill offshore California. Um, I would say it also includes the kind of onshore, on land oil production and expansion that's proposed here in Santa Barbara County. There are a few major projects proposed near Santa Maria that would use cyclic steam injection, this process that's the most energy intensive form of oil production in the world. It's the worst kind of oil production for the climate. Um, and it would mean a real increase in greenhouse gas emissions for our county at a time when we need to go the opposite direction. And by the way, it also means drilling through our groundwater aquifers, which are the sole source of water for large swaths of the county, at a time when we really need to take care of our water resources, right? We just built a desal plant. So that kind of industrial oil production, very bad for the climate, super energy intensive, we shouldn't do here either. Um, and so what can we do? On the, on the ocean drilling, we just need to register our resistance. And by being here tonight in this crowd, you are doing that. So thank you. They, they are not, they're only having one meeting on this in Sacramento and none in the coastal community. So I'm taking a picture of all of you and saying, we had our own meeting and here's what we say, no. So you, we're doing that. The other thing Santa Barbara did, and a lot of credit to Santa Barbara, it was the first city back in July to pass a resolution opposing new offshore oil. And that, that shows a community resistance, which is super important. And since they've done that, over 30 other municipalities across California, up and down California, have done, done so as well. And that includes Goleta and most recently Santa Barbara County. And as of today, Santa, San Diego County unanimously and Los Angeles County. So Santa Barbara was a trendsetter. <laughs> Santa Barbara was a trendsetter in a really good way. And that's important. The only one on the south coast left is Carpinteria. So if any of you have connections to Carpinteria, um, give those city council members a call and ask them are, if they're planning to pass a resolution opposing offshore oil prior to March 9th, which is the end of the comment period, which Linda will talk more about. That would be great to have them on board as well. And then the other thing that we need to do um, is reduce our own oil consumption because we're also, the United States is also the largest consumer of oil in the world by a lot. We are very much the problem. And we don't need to be. Santa Barbara is a great place to go electric. Um, I've been driving an electric car for eight years, and you could not pay me enough to go back 
to driving a gas car and having to stop at gas stations and get oil changes and spew exhaust wherever I go. You could not pay me literally <laughs> any amount to go back. Once you make the switch, you won't want to go back. And Santa Barbara could have the highest concentration of electric cars in the nation. That's another trend we should set. That's what we should be known for. And let's not, let's not restrict ourselves to people who can afford to drive or even make that make sh in, you know even that we have to drive because we can electrify our whole public transportation system too. Los Angeles has set a goal of 100% electric buses by 2030 and it'd be a lot easier for us to do than for them. So they can do it. We certainly can. And if we do that, if we do set goals like that, National Sierra Club is looking at Santa Barbara because it's a good name. It's a good brand. We will amplify the hell out of anything like that. And that's what Santa Barbara will be known for. And that's what Santa Barbara should be known for. We should be known for that, not just for oil spills and fires and mudslides and droughts. We should be known as a community that's seen the light and chosen another path and, and provides that example. So 100% clean energy, 100% clean public transportation. Let's make that happen here. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Okay, next up to talk about some cold, hard things that you guys can do to help is Linda Kropp from Environmental Defense Center. Thank you. It's great to see so many people out tonight. And thanks, Mike, for the historical perspective and Katie for showing us the light. Um, we do have choices. So what I'm gonna do is um, talk about how we can fight this horrible proposal. Um, so what happens is every five years, the federal government is required to come up with a plan to look at whether or not we should allow any more offshore oil and gas leasing. This requirement actually came as a result of the 1969 oil spill. We got a lot of great laws after the 1969 oil spill, and one of them was directed to the federal government, which was just cr going crazy issuing oil leases. Um, as Mike mentioned, most of the oil leases off of our coast were in the 60s um, originally. This amendment to the law said, whoa, slow down, be methodical, let the states weigh in, let the public weigh in, and take a measured approach. And so every five years, there's a new plan. It goes out for public comment. The states get to comment, especially the coastal states. And that's what we're talking about tonight. So we're actually already in a five-year plan. Um, the Obama administration adopted a plan that runs from 2017 to 2022. That's the current plan. The West Coast is not in that plan. In fact, we haven't had any oil leasing on the West Coast since 1984. And as was mentioned, that has been the result of bipartisan support for protection for the coast. But the new administration didn't want to wait till 2022 to come up with a new plan. So there's a draft plan out there that we all need to respond to. And that's uh, what tonight's forum is about. Um, so the way the lease process work is, is there's the five-year plan, then any areas included in the five-year plan can be issued as leases to private oil companies. Then they come in with their plans to explore for reserves, and then ultimately they come in and apply for permission to actually extract oil and develop and produce it. So this is the beginning of that process, but it's a very important beginning because if any area is not in the plan, it is saved from those subsequent activities uh, for the next five-year period. So what we're looking at is um, a draft plan, and we have until March 9th to comment on it. It's really important, even though there are subsequent phases and there will be a, a proposed plan and a final plan and things will go to Congress and the president, this initial stage is really important because actually under uh, President George W. Bush, the West Coast, including California, was included in the first draft plan. And there was so much opposition, the West Coast was taken out. 
So we can make a difference. We definitely um, need to make our voices heard. We have a lot of support at the statewide level and here in Santa Barbara, we are at the bullseye. If there's gonna be any oil leasing on the West Coast, it's gonna be here in the Santa Barbara Channel because we have oil and we have infrastructure and we have companies that operate here. So it's really up to us to make sure we protect our community. So um, this map doesn't show up very well, um, but this is the first time the entire nation's coast has been up for sale. It's never ever happened before. And I realize this administration likes to do things bigger than has ever happened before. Um, but it means something. So over 90% of the nation's coast is on the chopping block for more oil and gas development. Um, the Mexican, from the whole west coast from the Mexican border to the Oregon border, even though there's not even oil in some of those places, is on this map. Could you do the next slide, please? So, so what's at risk? Well, in our area, we have the Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary, the Channel Islands National Park. We have numerous marine protected areas. This region has been known as the Galapagos of North America. It was actually President Franklin uh, Roosevelt that came up with that because of the incredible biodiversity here. We have the highest level of biodiversity in the mainland United States right here in the Santa Barbara Channel region. So we have tremendous amount at stake ecologically. We also have a lot at stake in terms of our communities, in terms of tourism, in terms of recreation, in terms of fishing. From the 2015 Refugio oil spill, 140 square miles of commercial fishing was shut down for a couple months. Two state beach parks were shut down for a month or two. Recreation was dead, tourism was dead. We can't go through that again. So there's a lot at risk here. What we are asking folks to do, next slide please, um, is speak up. It's really easy. Uh, we have handouts in the back you may have picked up on your way in, um, but we let you know how you can submit your comments. You can submit them online or you can mail them in. We did not get a formal hearing here. Um, as was mentioned, the only hearing in all of California was in Sacramento, which is not even on the coast. So um, we tried to make our own hearing and um, we ask that you speak up. It's really important to be specific. Um, it's not helpful to just say, I don't want any more oil development off of the California coast. Um, they won't pay a lot of attention to that comment. What they will pay attention to is if you say, why? you don't want more development. So if you swim, if you surf, if you boat, if you fish, if you whale watch, if you go to the islands, um, say that and say where you do that and that you don't want any oil spills in that area or you don't want any water pollution in that area or you don't want um, you know, the risks of more air pollution that blows on shore. Um, you know, tell them where you live, uh, where you work, where you recreate. So be as specific as you can. You can provide documents, you can provide photographs, but tell your story and tell exactly what impacts you are concerned about. If you um, are involved with any volunteer organizations that work to save the environment here, um, if you have any kind of connection, um, if you're a scientist, if you're a researcher, if you're a citizen scientist, um, say that, but you know, try to be specific about what areas of the coast you enjoy, you want to continue enjoying, and how this is a threat, whether it's from you know, oil spills or some other reason. So thank you so much for being here, and uh, we will be available for questions um, after we hear from our wonderful elected representatives. Thank you, Linda. Before we move on, I just want to reiterate that those fact sheets are in the back. They're really helpful, so be sure to grab one if you haven't on your way out. And um, also, no. Oh, and also, um, as as we are uh, moving on to the next se section, there are note cards. Owen is holding some up, and Betsy's holding some up on the side. So if you have questions, raise your hand, and they'll come bring you a note card, um, and we will do, we will get to questions and answers. Um, so first up to uh, discuss some of the efforts done by your representatives, we have Jeanette Chang from Senator Dianne Feinstein's office. Hi, 
Hi, thank you so much for being here today. My name is Jeanette. I'm with Senator Feinstein's office. She's sorry she couldn't be here today. Senate's in session in Washington, D.C. So she asked me to read a statement on her behalf. Um, thank you for coming out today in defense of our coast. It is your opposition that will feed this disastrous plan for new offshore oil drilling off the coast. President Trump's proposal to invite offshore drilling rigs into nearly all of our country's waters has been met with outrage from every corner. Here in California, we know that offshore oil rigs aren't an abstract risk. It is here on our shores that almost 50 years ago, an offshore oil rig spilled more than 3 million gallons of crude oil into the Pacific Ocean, killing thousands of marine animals and birds. For decades now, California has successfully blocked new offshore drilling, and it is our responsibility to protect that legacy. Your voices show the Trump administration that an overwhelming majority of Californians oppose new drilling. And your voices remind the world that locking in decades of new fossil fuel production is unacceptable as we combat the growing problem of climate change. Senator Feinstein will continue to fight the president's plan back in Washington. She believes if the Californians stand united, we can block new drillings in our waters. And it is your voices that will make a difference in this fight. So thank you for coming out today and lending your voice. And if you have any questions, I'm available afterwards. Thank you. Next, we have Wendy Moda from Congressman Slude Carbajal's office. Good evening. I want to thank you all for being here to learn more about how you can stop future oil drilling. Your attendance shows your commitment to protecting our environment, and that commitment is what will drive our nation to do the right thing. On behalf of Congressman Carbajal, I want to thank EDC, Get Oil Out, and the Sierra Club for organizing this event. We live in one of the most beautiful and ecologically diverse locations in our nation. With our Channel Islands serving as a haven for many creatures, small and large. With this incredible privilege, we must also remember that we have great responsibility to this unique place. That is why Congressman Carbajal opposes any new leasing off our shore. And that is why the first piece of legislation he authored as Congressman was the California Clean Coast Act, which would permanently ban future oil and gas drilling off California's coast. <laughs> he also signed two letters to Secretary Zinke regarding the proposed leasing, pointing out the value of our coastline, not only to the environment, but also as an economic driver to our area. I have copies of the letters in the back if you would like some of those to use for your comments. As the panel stated, this is the first time the federal government has considered opening leases off the California coast since 1984. This proposal is exploring opening 90% of federal waters for further oil and gas development. We know oil is not the future, and it is certainly not logical if you believe in climate change. It wasn't long ago, a little under three years, that oil spilled on the Gaviota coast from a pipeline. For many of us, that brought back the horror of the 1969 platform blowout that spilled oil along Santa Barbara's shores. These consequences is why we must stay vigilant. We've seen the devastating environmental and economic threats posed by offshore oil drilling. That is why Congressman Carbajal is committed to reducing our dependence on fossil fuels. We must continue to push for more sustainable future energy, helping to keep our focus on renewable energy and away from reliance on fossil fuels. As you know, we have entered an uncertain time in our nation's history. 
This is the time to make your voice heard. I urge you to submit the comments now before the March 9th deadline. As Linda said, tell your story. Tell how it's going to hurt your hometown and your pocketbook. We must stand together as one united voice because we all know it's not a matter of if an oil spill will occur. It's a matter of when. Thank you. Next up, we have Brad Hudson from Senator Hannah Beth Jackson's office. Thank you. Good evening. Um, Senator Jackson regrets not being able to be here personally. She is in Sacramento, but asked me to share some of the work that she's doing um, to fight offshore drilling on along our coast. Last month, Senator Jackson introduced Senate Bill 834. Um, SB 834 directly responds to the recent amount announcement by Interior Secretary Zinke and the Trump administration to open federal waters off California to new offshore drilling by prohibiting our state agencies from approving leases and other infrastructure needed to transport the oil and gas through state waters and lands. Um, <laughs> Like SB 188, the senator's bill from last year, SB 834 will not affect current operations in state and federal waters. And it's important to note that this bill will only, um, only applies to future new and expanded federal leasing. But to summarize two points of the bill, um, the bill sends, first of all, sends a clear message to the Trump administration that no part of the state will be party to its environmentally destructive policies. Second, by prohibiting state participation in the conveyance of oil and gas that may be produced from the new leases, we want the oil companies to understand that taking President Trump up on his reckless offer will not only just be politically a costly proposition, but also economic costs will be too high for the new production to make financial sense. Um, SB 188, Senator's bill, the, Senator Jackson's bill from last year, was introduced in response to the threats from this administration that federal waters off California may be, be put back on the table after decades of bipartisan consensus that, and strong public in, assistance that no new offshore oil activity, activity should occur off our coastline. Um, it was a cornerstone of the California Senate's resistance to President Trump's destructive environmental policies. Unfortunately, SB 188 was held up in the assembly last year after a strong push from the oil and gas lobby, as well as opposition late in the process from other interests that were short-sighted considering the enormity and seriousness of the threat from this administration. The Senator's new bill, SB 834, brings back the policy of the previous bill, but with a new legislative strategy. Um, this year, an identical companion measure, AB 1775, jointly authored by Assembly members Le Monique Lamone and Al Masucci, um, were introduced in the State Assembly. So we expect that having these companion measures will allow both houses the legislative opportunity to fully consider the proposals, understand the implication of President Trump's attack on our resources, and come to a consensus on these bills. Our coast is an economic engine, and extended offshore oil and gas production directly threatens the health of California's ocean-based economy, which includes marine transportation and construction, commercial fishing and aquaculture, tourism and recreation. Our ocean economy produces more than $45 billion in GDP each year, and employs almost half a million people in the state, dwarfing the small fraction of jobs promised by the oil industry. It should be noted that the state of Florida was granted an exclusion from offshore drilling um, by Secretary Zinke, and South Carolina, Carolina has requested a similar exclusion. We in California expect the same. Thank you. Now we have Samantha Omana from Assembly Men Members, Monique Limon's office. Hello, 
thank you guys all for being here tonight. Um, this is an issue near and dear to the assembly member's heart. Uh, just last week in Sacramento, before the uh, Bureau of Ocean Energy Management hearing, the assembly member presented a assembly joint resolution on this very, on this very topic. Um, this joint resolution strongly and unequivocally condemned opening up the California coastline to offshore drilling. Now, currently in Sacramento, the legislature is also working on AB or working on SB 834, which you heard about earlier from Senator Jackson's office. Uh, Assemblymember Monique Limon authored a companion bill, AB 1775, in the assembly to make sure that this bill has the best chance to pass the legislature. Uh, so, standing up and speaking out are some of the best things you can do to combat this newest. Uh, proposal by the federal government. Um, and the most important way to speak out is to submit a comment to the Bureau of Ocean and Energy Management, like we were talking about earlier. Uh, so the comment period is open until March 9th, and it is so important to see just how many people oppose this project. The environmental health of our coastline is paramount because it is integral to the way of life along the coast. People come from all over to see the expansive and beautiful coastline. All along California, there are people that rely on this industry to support their families, and we cannot risk another catastrophic oil spill. It's too big of a risk, both for the local coastal community and for the ecosystem that supports it. All right, thank you so much. Thank you. Now we have Supervisor Doss Williams. Good evening, it's so inspirational to see this place packed. Uh, and you know, for someone uh, who's, uh, you know, the ocean is so important to me, um, it is wonderful to represent a community where uh, resistance to oil is about as traditional as cascaronis, and goes back as far, if you read history, um, it predates the, the oil spill. Though, of course, the oil spill was a galvanizing force and made our community um, a leader in thought to question sort of what kind of society um, uh, we had wrought and what kind of dependence on fossil fuels that we lived in. Um, but now is the time that we really need to um, transform that from leadership in thought to leadership in deed. Um, and uh, that is not only uh, the resistance to this federal move, but we have to show people um, the, the, what can be done instead. Um, I think Katie uh, touched on a couple of those things. Uh, I think Katie is my environmental soulmate, I've decided. Um, uh, the, uh, she, the, the, um, and I, I give you this from the viewpoint of dealing with legislators in other areas, legislators that have very different ideas and different values. We would be much more powerful if we could reduce our own hypocrisy. Um, our message would transform this state and possibly this country if we can do that. So I just want to give you a couple things to galvanize you a little bit more. Even though we um, have been a leader in this thought for many, many decades, we have yet to permit one utility scale renewable energy project in the entire South County, right? That should be something that really bothers us because it undermines our message. Um, we are still a community that um, uh, is behind the ball in terms of actually executing the thoughts, um, the transformative philosophy that we were so instrumental in creating in the first place. So we, that should galvanize us. And then um, because, there's some, because of, the, of the day of the week, there's a lot of staffers here and it would be illegal for them to say this, so I'm gonna say something else. Um, we've got to hold Congress accountable to being um, part of this and not being willing to stand in the way of the President's plans. 
And so that means we have to defend salute carbohol. And, and we need to be, we need to, to defend salute and we need to also look at all the seats in California that could fall if we um, galvanize as a state and community. Um, and then lastly, thank you. Um, oh, and I would be remiss if I didn't mention the county was one of the most recent resolutions in, in response um, and uh, authored by uh, Supervisor Hartman and myself. Uh, so thank you, Gina, for being here representing Supervisor Hartman. And, um, but lastly, um, we got to back it up with our, our economic power as well. Um, you know, I think it's important for us in these times to think about how in this country, when the vast majority of us care about climate change, when the vast majority of us want to oppose oil, how can they keep on winning, right? And I think one of the most fundamental things is because we, we oppose it with our words and then we support it every week with our dollars, right? And our actions do speak louder. And so I know it always seems that it's just me. I'm just a drop in the ocean. But the, the power, the longer I do public policy, the more I realize Government, we are a part of the solution, but we're 20, 30% of the solution. The rest of that is what, and maybe industry, 20, 30% of the solution. 40% of the solution or more is consumer power, is us voting for what kind of world we want to live in every single day with our choices. Um, and as the world's biggest consumer of, of fossil fuels, that power um, is, would be unbeatable because that evil empire will not stand if we refuse to support it. Thank you so much. Thank you all so much for your contributions. I'm gonna invite the panelists back up to sit in front of us and um, answer some questions, which I'm sure we will have some for our um, elected officials and staff as well. Nice, Katie. Out of it, but I'm doing it. <laughs> okay, so um, I have some questions here, and again, if you have questions of your own, please look for Owen or Betsy with note cards, and they can bring you one. So the first question we have is I already submitted one comment. Does it help for a single individual to submit multiple comments? And maybe I'll add a little uh, piece to this too. I know some, some of us in the crowd probably are belong to other nonprofit organizations that have sent out action alerts and had you click on something and then sign a stock form. So maybe we could clarify how that could help to do another comment. Hi, um, I think as long as you have something additional to say, um, it can be very helpful. You may have, you know, Tonight may inspire you to think of something else that you want to say, or you may read something between now and March 9th. So yeah, if you have anything additional to say or any additional um, reference or report or study you want to submit, absolutely, you can do that. On, so I'm just talking. It's on? Okay. You can also submit on behalf of a, any organization. You have a, a neighborhood association. So think of other organizations. It's often more effective to say I'm representing an organization than just you personally. So do both. Great. So if these decisions are made in Washington, D.C. through a political lens, how does opposition from California, a blue state, help? And Jeanette. 
Maybe, I, 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 think, I think Jeanette and Wendy can. Uh, so if these that. decisions are made in Washington, D.C. through a political lens, how does opposition from California, a blue state, help? <laughs> or, you know, that's a tough one because uh, they're not really listening to California right now. So, uh, but when you write those comments, I think it's really important because, and I think you should talk to as many friends as you can and get them to write comments because if we make our voice heard in that process and they don't listen, we've got you know a clear picture that they aren't. And so we, we have to show them that we do not want this and the, the, if we are strong and do that and get a lot of numbers there and I just can't see th that if they if they totally ignore us, it's just going to be, it's going to be give us some power for the future, and because we need to, you know, keep tabs of what's going on. We just have to keep working at it. So I, I think California is a leader, and we need to remember we're a leader, and you know, like Doss said, and and Katie said. We need to push it a little harder. We can do that here in Santa Barbara. We can get a little greener. We can get away from this fossil fuel and show everyone we can be leaders in that. So I think California can, can make a, a difference if they write those comments. Thank you. And the federal government doesn't get to do this alone. They offer the leases, and then people have to buy them. And if you scare away the oil companies and make them think that they're never going to be able to develop those leases, they may not even try to go after them anyway. There are other ways to get there. Perfect timing, Katie. There's a question as to whether or not oil companies are pushing to drill in California right now. Not really. They're, they're not <laughs> I think this is working, so keep it up. Yeah, in the, one of the um, sections of the proposed program um, is a chapter devoted to industry interest, and out of the entire West Coast, the only area where there has been any registered industry interest in this plan is the Santa Barbara Channel area. So even though we may think that it's not real, or um, you know that they're you know, worried about all the roadblocks from the state and the county um, in the plan. They have expressed interest, so that's why we need to support these two state bills um, that can shut the door. And uh, we do need to show them that the county is going to be um, a big fighter because a lot of these decisions for what happens to that oil and gas when it comes on shore rests with the county. So the fact that our county board has um, expressed its opinion is really important um, because we can't take this for granted. Um, and in fact, several of the platforms off the coast right now are up for decommissioning soon. And so there's at least, there's anywhere from probably um, three to six platforms that could actually be decommissioned. So that's the path we want to push for. Counties can pass resolutions too, like the state is doing. So you can do that at the county level. Um, so we could maybe make those stronger too, and say if you do develop, you're not, we're not going to let you bring it on shore or do any process it here. Or, or maybe. I think it's generally a matter of economics for the oil companies, but it's people like us who are a huge thorn in the side <laughs> of the oil companies that uh, will keep them from uh, inter being interested in our coastline and, and uh, channel. Great. So this one asks, I understand oil trucks are unsafe, but pipelines are notoriously leaky. Won't building new pipelines strengthen our county's oil infrastructure and thus attract new business? Well, as Mike mentioned, there are a couple proposals before the county, and one is um, by Exxon to truck oil um, that they have not been able to uh, produced since the pipeline oil spill. So they want to resume production from their three platforms off the Gaviota Coast and send that oil by truck. That has never happened. Um, and our county policy discourages anything like that from happening. But nevertheless, once again, you know, we have to speak up. We have to show Exxon um, that we're not going to let them get through this process. We have to show the county how we feel about it. 
Um, there's also a proposal to rebuild the pipeline, actually build a replacement pipeline. And when that pipeline was built, the community and environmental groups actually supported it because the alternative was tankering. And we used to have tankering from the coast. We had several marine terminals up and down the coast. So the pipeline was seen as the pref preferred option. Um, unfortunately, uh, the company that built that pipeline um, did not comply with county standards and did not put in safety mechanisms that would have shut down the pipeline immediately and minimized the extent of the spill. Since that pipeline, um, Doss Williams as assembly member and Hannah Beth Jackson in the Senate quickly <laughs> passed a couple bills that um, regulate pipelines in a much stricter fashion that would give the county this time around the authority to require better technology. So it's a major project to build a whole new pipeline to support offshore oil and would go through three counties, cross lots of rivers and creeks. Um, they might have to seize people's land by public, public domain. Um, so it's problematic to be approving a new pipeline after one burst and we're trying to post new oil. So no, <laughs> if that's a great idea either. So I, I had an, another question here that I think piggybacks on that a bit, but I think it was answered. So if you ask this question and it hasn't been answered, feel free to clarify, but it was a question as to um, why would the County Board of Supervisors approve a new onshore oil pipeline if we were symbolically saying that we don't want any more offshore oil, but hopefully that was answered. And if not, please let me know. Um, here's another one. There is already fracking off some platforms. Will they continue and are they getting permits to do so? Yes, they are and yes, they will. And uh, BOEM, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management is the one that approves those and they're ri they've rubber stamped them. Linda should talk to this because you're suing them. <laughs> That's correct. <laughs> Good lead in. What Katie said. <laughs> so yeah, the Environmental Defense Center on behalf of EDC and Santa Barbara Channel Keeper sued the federal government, including the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, uh, for approving permits for fracking and also a similar type of oil drilling called acidizing. Uh, both types of oil drilling have never been fully studied. Um, the impacts have never been disclosed and they use incredibly toxic chemicals um, at the platforms. And so we brought a lawsuit um, to try to stop that practice. And uh, yesterday, we filed our opening brief and we have a hearing in August. So stay tuned. <laughs> I just want to add that they, they just take the, the wastewater and they can dump it back in the ocean in federal waters. You couldn't do that in state waters, but that's what they're doing with the fracking wastewater. So, yeah, really bad. Go ahead. Yeah. Answered. So you normally you don't want to answer an unpopular question, but I, I will. Uh, because I think it, what it alludes to is the, the fact that county board, by unanimous vote, approved an oil pipeline um, in, in the last couple weeks. Um, and, and, and the answer is this, is, this is chess, it ain't checkers. When a pipeline can knock down current truck trips, yeah, that's a good thing. That, that's safer, lower carbon emissions. Um, you know, we shouldn't be against oil companies reducing their carbon emissions and improving their safety. However, it's incumbent upon us as the board, as board members, to then also, um, when the oil company comes back and says, hey, why don't you permit a bunch of a drilling because I did this pipeline, that you go, mm, that's not what the deal was, right? Um, uh, and so that's, that's re really, you have to calculate what, what will be the effects um, uh, both in terms of, of GHG effects, in terms of safety effects. Um, you know, Linda and I worked for years and years and years to try to get Benico to pipeline their oil to shore instead of tanker it. That was a real victory. Um, and, and, and so sometimes it's going to be the best option that's there. So this one is a legal question. 
Can residents of the coastal regions bring suit to enjoin the federal government from leasing the proposed areas based on the health effects and ramifications? I'll say yes. <laughs> um, we've never shied away. Um, but to bring a lawsuit, it's, we can't bring a lawsuit until the process ends with a final decision and then we base our lawsuit on what was said during the process. That's why your input is so important because the more issues you raise, the more concerns you raise, if you have data about the public health impacts, we can use that in our lawsuit. So you can actually help build the lawsuit that we can bring down the road. Okay, so this question I'm going to read. Um, we did hear about this, but if, in case you didn't get here, this is really great information. So, I heard that the state of California is considering passing a law that would forbid any infrastructure associated with new leases, either onshore or in the three mile section of the ocean that is under the, uh, the purview of the state. Is this happening? So, we heard about this a little bit, but maybe reiterate. Okay, um, I mean, with all <laughs> credit to um, State Senator Hannah Beth Jackson and Assemblymember Monique Limon, um, there are two bills in the state legislature, SB 834 and AB 1775, that would prohibit the state from approving any infrastructure or leases that would allow the transport of oil and gas from federal waters through state waters to get to shore for processing, for refining, for transport to market. So if they can't get that oil and gas to shore, they can't get it anywhere. So it's a tremendous tool. Uh, we have to make sure that these bills pass. So anything you can do, you know, contact Senator Jackson's office and Assemblymember Limon's office. Um, as Katie said, get, you know, your homeowners associations, any business organizations. We need bipartisan support. Uh, we need support from labor, we need support from businesses um, when we get to Sacramento. So it's really, really important to think outside the box and to get support for these bills. And I just want to say how cool is it that our region, our state senator, and our state assemblywoman are the ones really leading the charge here. Um, it's so cool. I was on a call with the executive director of Sierra Club California and she, recently, and she just called out, she said, and I just want to talk about this freshman assembly woman, Monique Lamone, who's been fearless in facing oil. So she's got special call out and recognition. Thank you. Okay. I think, I think also from the standpoint of Get Oil Out, it makes our work that we do and our mission of preventing oil spills in the channel much easier uh, having uh, a political force that's on our team rather than opposing us. Okay, I'll save you guys from this one and answer this one myself. Um, the Shumash have some connections in Washington. Have you spoken to them on this subject? I will say that there were Shumash representatives in Sacramento with a few of us on Thursday and they were speaking at the state capitol and we were supposed to have a representative here tonight that couldn't make it due to a community event. So yes, we are talking to them and thank you very much for that thought. And then this other question, um, has city council fully divested from oil and if not, what is the plan? Well, we do have one city council member here today, um, <laughs> if you wanna speak to that. Santa Barbara not. did recently, and it was, you know, it's a small amount, but it's important symbolically. And this was the one Facebook post that I put up that was shared by Sierra Club National and got, I don't know, hundreds of thousands of views, the most <laughs> views I've ever gotten. So Santa Barbara taking that one action, it really, it has ripple effects um, and really shows that the trend is away from funding fossil fuels. Ripple to Goleta? Ripple to Goleta, maybe. <laughs> Does the National Park Service or National Marine Sanctuary have a say with regard to the environmental impact that drilling could bring to our channel and the park slash sanctuary? Yeah, okay, great. I'll take this one too. So I sit on the Sanctuary Advisory Council uh, 
for, sorry, the Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary Advisory Council in the conservation seat. And we recently, as a council, sent in a letter in opposition of any new oil and gas drilling in the Santa Barbara region and, and further out to, that basically, that to say that would impact any sanctuaries on the West Coast, which pretty much is the West Coast. So in terms of what we can do, um, that's, we can influence uh, decisions outside of the sanctuary and the park. The actual uh, agencies themselves are limited to their regulations within, but there, there are mechanisms the such as that. The Sanctuary Foundation, too, which is a separate yeah. from the sanctuary itself, also encourage members to submit comments against offshore leasing in the Pacific and to protect the sanctuaries. Um, the sanctuary itself, I mean, they report into NOAA, which reports up to Trump, so they're constrained. But there's right. organizations that support it and that um, we need to show support and like support our sanctuaries from around it. Right, and we're pretty lucky in California because <clears throat> a lot of our coastline is a national marine sanctuary, so that's great for us. Um, Someone is asking about really good studies pertaining to the effects of sonic and seismic testing on sea life. There are um, quite a lot of studies. Um, the Environmental Defense Center was involved in this issue. We actually um, threatened to sue over a seismic survey in the 1990s that was proposed by Exxon off of our coast. Um, so there are a lot of studies about the impacts of seismic activities. So these are activities that occur during the exploration phase. So once an oil company buys a lease, the first thing they do is try to figure out how much oil and gas exists within that area and whether or not it's worth them putting the money into putting in a platform and all the infrastructure. So there's a few ways that they can do that. One is through a seismic survey. So it's basically um, from a vessel shooting um, air guns down that go subsea and send signals back. So it's uh, very intense frequency sound waves. And there are a lot of studies about the impacts of these studies on marine mammals, um, but there's also studies that indicate pretty significant impacts on fish and other sea life. So um, there's a growing body of research and if that's something of concern to you, you could even probably just you know, look online and, and search for some studies and then submit them with your comments. I encourage you to do that. Great. I have a couple comments here that aren't necessarily questions, so I will um, read those now before we get to these last few questions. Um, only 22 minutes were aired on national news regarding climate change out of over 132,000 minutes. Will all of you commit to asking the local news media to cover climate change every day so that the public is informed? <laughs> <laughs> and this one says, not to change the subject of oil drilling too much, but be aware that the batteries from electric cars are highly toxic and will be toxic to the planet if and when disposed of. There's a slippery slope and the public needs to know about this fact. And then we have a question that I think is beyond the scope of this, but I will read it, which is what is stopping us from running energy efficient trains on our rails and why doesn't the public own the rails? <laughs> so coming back to this uh, offshore oil issue, um, how do we counter the argument that natural seeps in our local oceans produce more air pollution than do man-made emissions? <laughs> My favorite issue. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, good question. Um, I, I shouldn't be facetious about that. Um, it's something we do hear about quite often. So first of all, natural seeps are natural. Um, they've been off our coast for centuries. And um, the gas that emits from these natural seeps is weatherized by the time it reaches the ocean surface. So there definitely are emissions associated with natural seeps. We can't confuse that with an oil spill and emissions from oil development, which are human caused and much more voluminous. And especially if you look at the other types of impacts from natural seeps versus oil spills in the marine environment, there's just no comparison at all. So the natural seeps are natural, um, oil spills are not natural. And so we need to do everything we can to prevent them. Yeah. 
This question asks if we know the names of the oil companies interested in buying leases and suggests possibly sending letters to those companies. <laughs> Linda's getting her notebook. <laughs> Look up this? Yeah, absolutely. She's looking it up for you. Okay, well, while Linda looks that up, I'm going it's to a great idea. make a quick announcement. Um, on March 20th at 6.30 p.m., there will be a showing of Broke, which is a film about the Refugio oil spill, and the filmmaker Gail Osharenko is in the room right now, I believe. Um, <laughs> Oh, she may have left. Well, anyways, Gail is the fabulous filmmaker. And there will be, a, it'll be at the New Vic Theater, and there will be questions and answers with both Gail and Linda, who's sitting up here. And there will be a reception after the film. So we invite everyone to come and see this film. You do need to secure a spot through the Environmental Defense Center. So I'm, say what again? The date is March 20th. It's at 6.30 p.m. at the New Vic Theater. So I'm sure that um, after this event, you'll all be getting an email that has uh, information on how to comment on this offshore oil plan, as well as how you can help with state legislation, and I'm sure how you could secure a spot for that film. So we wanted to make sure that you all knew about that opportunity, and you'll be hearing more about it in the follow-up that we will send. And maybe we have an answer to that question. So we have consulted the draft program. Mm -hmm. um, so in terms of the industry interest, as I mentioned, um, in the Pacific region, it's all focused on our area. The interest that has been um, made known is mostly um, several oil and gas um, associations. So it's hard to pick out the exact companies. The only individual companies I see are Statoil, USA, e &P, and Cobalt International Energy, and then the rest are a bunch of associations. I like the idea of sending them all a letter. Yeah, so if you, if you um, online you can access the full program, it's page 9-1. <laughs> <laughs> have fun downloading that. Okay, well I think we have finished all of our questions. If anyone has any final thoughts, feel free. Otherwise, oh, one thing I wanted to yeah. say was maybe regressing a little bit back to the uh, seepage. One of the questions that I get a lot at the different events, uh, Earth Day and tabling events that Get Oil Out does is that uh, people ask me whether uh, oil drilling reduces the natural seepage. And uh, it's Get Oil Out's position that uh, it does not, and that's based on expert, uh, local expert uh, experts who've analyzed the uh, seeps and the aqued oil aqueducts where the oil comes from and um, it's it's mutually exclusive is, is what they're saying. Um, there's also uh, the, a side that's saying well if you drill then it's going to reduce natural seepage and uh, it's kind of it's come to my attention that the, those people are paid experts but from the oil companies mm -hmm. and so that's that would be my answer for that question. And you can believe whichever way you want to believe. <laughs> and I wanted to make one final comment because I mentioned these onshore projects. So I wanted to speak to how you could oppose those as well because those are fully under our um, control. Those projects will come to our Santa Barbara County Planning Commission and then get appealed whichever way they rule to the Santa Barbara County supervisors. So if you see any Santa Barbara County supervisors, Doss just left so you can't <laughs> talk to him. But any planning commissioners, tell them uh, you oppose these projects and they're not worth the risks in Santa Barbara County. Or write them. Gina in Joan Hartman's office said, write that down. Don't just tell her. <laughs> and show up at the hearings. Yeah. And get on the, uh, our mailing list and we'll tell you when they are. And um, an email list. Yeah, email list. I guess I just want to leave us with um, a positive thought. In 2010, the Pacific region was in the draft program, and because there was so much opposition from California and from our community, we were taken out. So we need to make that happen again. It was a Republican administration then, and 
you know, we still prevailed. We have support from the governor, from the Senate, from the Assembly, from the Ocean Protection Council, from the State Lands Commission, from the Coastal Commission. And we need to hold our state representatives up by having all of our communities support them in that effort. So, um, you know, I can't emphasize enough that we really can make a difference. So thank you. <laughs> Thank you all. You guys are inspiring for being here. Please give yourselves a round of applause for being engaged and writing comments and sending them in. Thank you.